Um, first, about this sort of quasi-theological view about the progress of morality. I think the difference between Genghis Khan and Adolf Hitler was that Hitler was thoroughly modern in the sense that he was a monotheist, a secular monotheist, as all the great isms of recent history have been messianic attempts to salvage humanity. Uh, and what we find is that the reason there's reduction in violence, basically in this world right now, is because the United States has a military budget larger than all the nations of the world combined with military presence in over 100 nations in the world. That's the majority of the nations of the world. And it's basically keeping violence, though it appears paradoxical, at a fairly low level compared to, say, what's happening in Rwanda or in the Congo. However, the history of the last few centuries shows that there's a power law distribution in wars so that we might expect the next war to be vastly more savage and cruel than any previous war, much more uh, a cause of destruction. And we were very close. In October 1962, the, sober, the, the United States did not know that the Kremlin had given operational control of the release of nuclear weapons to submarine commanders. Depth charges were dropped on one uh, Soviet sub. Two of the commanders voted to release nuclear weapons. Vasily Arkhipov, who's probably the world's greatest hero, saved the world by refusing to launch nuclear weapons on the United States. Had he had done, the power law distribution would have kicked in. Same is true uh, for terrorist events. So I think in terms of things like reduction of violence and even morality, I don't think Hitler is an aberration, and I don't think the next phase or phase shift is predictable, and we know from this power law distribution that most of history's changes is a result of these infrequent, massive wars. Uh, second point I want to... Number of casualties per event. Per, per incident. Yes. Um, and as far, I think you're right on with respect to the stickleback principle of human culture. That is, most of human culture is byproducts. Uh, lipstick works as a byproduct. Pornography, I mean, why do we look at or get hot and bothered by pixels on a computer screen or wood pulp? Certainly doesn't have reproductive value, but it works every time. Why is McDonald's so good at giving us fast foods and sugars and making us so fat that we explode? Just like the frog, my kids used to give frogs little dabs of paper till they exploded because of their release um, mechanisms. And, but I think that helps to explain why the problem of religious violence is not a problem of belief. The problem of religious violence is a problem of group dynamics. If you look at suicide terrorism, just as an example, you find that the mode is eight members of a squad. You can never predict, there is no profiling across any suicide groups. They're generally well-educated, they're positively correlated with science education, for example. The most representative category is engineer followed by physician, although that's the same two groups that rank religion highly in the National Academies uh, study. But what you find is this. Within any such group, they are remarkably homogeneous. They eat alike, they dress alike, and you can usually crack a cell, if you're an intelligence operative, by figuring out what food they eat and whether they belong together on a soccer team. And what they do is they create a group of fictive kin that performs as a family, just like a platoon in the trenches, and sacrifice for one another the way a mother would for a child or a sibling for a sibling. And I think that explains what they're doing much more than simply their belief system. And you can get almost anybody to do that. You can get people to do that on the front lines in any uh, war. Uh, we did one study with French foreign legionnaires where we looked at what happened to them over time. A group of, they came from all different countries. They spoke different languages. They stopped speaking their different language and started speaking French. They shaved off their body hair and slowly grew it back as they trained together, started singing French songs, growing the beard, putting on the kepi, and at the end you had a group led by a Waffen-SS officer and a former Auschwitz survivor 
who are willing to die for one another as a mother for a child. So this small group dynamics uh, can create things like suicide, and in fact is the largest predictor of suicide, terrorism. And in terms of human groups generally, it is just the case that all political systems we know of are expressed in terms of fictive kinship. Well, um, what about those uh, suicide bombers whose own testimony constantly refers to paradise and, and, um, and tomorrow I shall be in paradise, that kind of thing? I mean, I know that there are other groups such as the Tamil Tigers who are not particularly religiously motivated, but in the case of Islamic uh, suicide terrorists, um, I thought there was good evidence that they are obsessed with the afterlife. They certainly express things in terms of the idiom of afterlife, but in terms of all the people we've debriefed uh, and their families, uh, no one has ever done it for the virgins, and if every, anybody ever expressed any interest in doing it for the virgins, uh, they'd be refused. Yeah, I, I didn't mention the virgins. In it, as it was. Yeah, but somebody else did. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yes, in, they do mention it, but paradise Paradise is quite a different concept. It is a concept of family union, because you bring your family, of yeah. family union. And it is uh, one of, um, I must say, one of love and compassion, though it may seem crazy. That's exactly what it is. I've never seen a single one of these guys angry, seething, hateful, spiteful, I've seen them quite idealistic and nice guys, basically. The reason I asked you up, by the way, was, was in response to the earlier thing as well, although you've gone to a different point, which was the, the sense that there was no science, no data in what some of the other people were saying. And I think I, I thought you know, Mazarin has got quite just, a bit of data. And I think well, the, the, the things that Pat Churchton were talking about as well in terms of the... Um, some of the underpinnings of behavior also have some, some, a, a decent data set, so... I just want to follow up on what you said, which I, I agree with, um, that, that it's the group dynamics of this, and that's where I think my science has certainly failed in not really grasping or understanding the mechanisms by which it, it forms and so on. But I'm surprised to hear you say that belief is not involved, because I would think belief would be part of what it is that you use to create that group dynamic. So if we were to give them surveys or tests like these, I bet that there would be enormous similarity of view about what's important in this life, in an afterlife, whatever. So I would put belief right there, along with all the other things that make for that group dynamic. It's stunningly similar. So I, you know, I trek with Mujahideen from Sulawesi to the suburbs of Paris. And the message is remarkably flat and homogeneous, but it is an empty message. That is, again, in terms of its actual content, it's fairly empty. What you, again, what you get is within any one particular group, there is a very strong consensus and convergence in what their particular beliefs are in that particular context. But the whole religious ideology is basically a cipher. It is a signpost of communication, just like Mao's Little Red Book it was, without anybody actually believing, knowing even what they believe. But, but what about the, the, the motive for say, hating the United States in the first place. I mean, this, this obsession with women, this obsession with nudity, the obsession with um, uh, got you. The, the, the sort of fear of female sexuality, um, the obsession with hedonism, all these things which come straight from Islam. No, it comes straight from Arabia, which is quite different. It's a patrilineal, patrilateral society, so that all inheritance and obligations are traced through the male line in a segmentary lineage system so that if there is any single hint of hanky-panky anywhere in the male line, all political prestige traced through a thousand years, in the case of Arab families, two thousand years, is destroyed. So in order to keep the political system strong, you cannot tolerate any possible hanky-panky on the part of women. And so women are eliminated that have any suspicion now, that ideology has mutated, has jumped, and one of the interesting things you find in places like Indonesia today, or Malaysia, is the Arabization, the Islamic, the re-Arabization of Islam, which is something quite different than Islam 
itself. Let me just say one more thing about Islam. Uh, people say that, oh, well, Islam had this golden age, right? And it disappeared. What? What happened? Was there a flip-flop of an essence? Okay? China had a golden age, too. It stopped. All of a sudden, it's starting again. Did, it, did Confucianism have a flip-flop of essence? No. What happened was there were massive waves of Mongols and other Asian hordes from the steppes and the Turks. And then the colonials completely sundered uh, the Arab heartland. It is only being reconstituted very slowly today. And the jihadis see themselves as the vanguard of a massive transnational media-driven political awakening of which the Arabian mythos, if you want, is the motive to, as people have said here, reconquer dignity. Now, whether the particular beliefs are crazy, crackpot, I surely believe they are, as much as I believe Nazi beliefs are crazy in Paraka, we've got to deal with the political situation, the military situation, and the, the group dynamics. Of it. When I hear Sam say to me, oh, well, we can't show uh, respect. Well, let me tell you, I do hostage negotiation. And when you do hostage negotiation, you get the State Department or the Defense Department giving me the same attitude. These guys are creeps. They're morons. I say, just get out of my hair, because they're, you're going to get my hostage killed. What you've got to do is you've got to show empathy and respect to these people. And you've, you've got to do it fairly sincerely, because like in love, you can tell when it's insincere. And that's the way you move in the real world. You can't just say, oh, it's bad. Let's forget it. Let's destroy it. You can do that in Lynchburg. Okay? You can do that here, but you can't do it over there. If you do, you're dead, your hostage is dead, and so are the people you're trying to help. Well, if you're a hostage negotiator, of course. I mean, that, I mean you know. That, that, yeah, but not... we're, we're in situations like that all over the world. That's, what, that's where the battle lines are. That's where, that's where the political battles have to be engaged at that level. Yeah, there's a number of people who want to ask a question. Can I just um, go to the booth for a second, just a second? How, how much time do you, do you need to do a tape change? Yes. Could you do it very quickly? <laughs>